a phone call with Reed on the line, and he talked about his work in Texas, where he tried to do a work in barbershop projects identifying uh, black patients with high blood pressure controlled, and uh, shared that it didn't seem to work very well when we tried to route patients back to the primary care providers when not much change in blood pressure. Um, and so I, I went back and talked to my department chair. I said, what do you think? Do you think we should propose uh, getting pharmacists involved? She said, absolutely, why not? So, um, so I went back to him and I said, hey, what do you think? What, what, would, you, would you consider getting pharmacists involved? And then I kind of gave him a quick history of pharmacists and hypertension. And as he, he probably listened to two things I said and, and then <laughs> did his own research and said, hey, this is actually a good idea. You know, based on my own research, I see that there's some pretty darn good data supporting pharmacists in this space. Um, and so what we did was we <clears throat> got together and came up with the first version of the protocol, which is very different than <clears throat> what was eventually being used. <coughs> Excuse me, had <clears throat> some of the core drug classes, but not the specific drugs being used. Um, but that was used in a pilot. Um, one of my fellows worked with them for, I think, almost a year and uh, gathered some you know, preliminary information working with about 11 different barbershops, um, sorry, 11 different <coughs> primary care physicians and barbershops in past Altadena, I think it was, in, in the early location. Um, and got enough pilot data to show that yeah, this, this does work, it looks pretty good. So he went ahead and uh, applied for his NIH grant um, and lo and behold, he gets $8 million to support this work that we're now seeing uh, having been published in 2018. Um, so what happened to me? Well, I was <laughs> there to work with them, and about the time that he was applying for his grant, we got our senior mind grants, and so I, I had to not spend much time with him, unfortunately. Um, so you know, his success was really all his team that's here today, uh, just an amazing group that he's put together. Uh, the work they've done is really what we're here to talk about. Um, so I, I probably have some groundwork. Um, the, expert, the real experts are in the room. Um, Adair, can you pronounce your last name for me? It's, what? By the way, sorry, thank you. This, she is one of the frontline pharmacists uh, very early on in the program, and um, you have great articles about you all over the place. I read about you, your quotes all the time, it's fantastic. Uh, then we have Dr. Florian Bader, who's taken over uh, Dr. Ron Victor's role, and I think all of you know that, um, or said Dr. Victor passed um, last September um, from a long-standing illness, but you know, we're all excited uh, to continue on his work. I think that's what he wants. Uh, this is, you know, I, I had a chance to sit down with him after he testified in front of the uh, State Assembly uh, on the importance of this work. And, and I said, of all the things you've done, and believe me, he's got a long list of things he's done that are remarkable, uh, where does this rank, this publication in the journal of medicine? So he, without hesitation, number one, this, this was, this was his, um, his greatest pride and joy uh, in, in his life. So uh, I, 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 we want to all honor that by uh, taking this wonderful work and making it matter, making it work for uh, patients that we serve. Uh, so again, Dr. Rader is now Director of the Sears Sinai Health uh, Heart Institute, uh, in charge of the barbershop program. He told me to keep his intro short, and, and he's so um, modest <laughs> that he didn't even give much information. On his bio. <laughs> but but he is a, a cardiologist and hypertension specialist, uh, trained at Cedars partially. Is that I right? No, I, I trained at Case. Case yeah, okay. And, okay. Okay. So you didn't put any of those yeah. great details in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and he's here to talk about sort of the next steps. You know, how do we take an excellent proof of concept? Ninety percent of patients get their goal. Uh, and translated to a sustainable program. So, with that, I'll pass Did it you off. say 90%? 90%. You can talk about that. 90%. Yeah, I'll, I'll show those numbers. So, so, thanks, Steve, for inviting me. Thank you, Harry, too. Um, it's nice to speak in front of a crowd who you don't have to convince that high blood pressure is the prime suspect when it comes to cardiovascular mortality. So, I'm really thrilled to speak here. Um, just a couple of disclaimers. Um, I just want to make it clear that my involvement in the barbershop study was really marginal. Um, now I'm more involved with um, continuing the work and uh, publishing um, the data that was partially collected before Ron Victor passed. Um, but um, clearly uh, praises to those who deserve it. So the background of the barbershop study is that among non-Hispanic black men, um, they have the highest hypertension-related death rate in the United States. Um, and they have less physician interaction with lower hypertension treatment and control rates than black women and um, certainly other groups um, in the United States. So the um, necess necessity for community outreach um, was pretty clear. How to do that was a little less clear. Um, and then uh, why the barbershop? So it, it has been well established, it has been studied um, in lots of smaller pilot um, studies and uh, smaller trials. Um, the real question was, can it improve hypertension control? Because um, Ron actually tried this before in Dallas, and there it wasn't quite so successful. 
So that's why he went back to the drawing board and um, thought about how can we make this work. So the aim of this was actually to develop an effective intervention which links health promotion by Barbas to drug therapy by pharmacists and to evaluate the efficacy in a cluster randomized controlled trial. Um, and pharmacists' actions have improved hypertension control in over 40 randomized controlled trials, and that's why Steve uh, Chen was actually um, suggesting this approach to Iran. Um, and here's sort of the uh, overall uh, study design. So the intervention group um, went to the barbershops. Um, the barbers promoted follow-up with specialty trained pharmacists, and then the pharmacists met the patrons monthly at the barbershops they check blood pressure, prescribe medications through a collaborative practice agreement. So they actually discussed um, the treatment plan with the uh, primary care physician. Primary care physician signed off on a contract um, between the pharmacist and uh, the physician um, to give them uh, prescriptive power to sort of guide their hypertension treatment. Um, and the pharmacist also monitored electrolytes with a point of care uh, basic metabolic panel device, which is very convenient, um, and then sent progress notes to the primary care physician so they were kept informed throughout the process. Um, versus the control group, and again, it was a cluster randomized trial, so cluster means the barbershops were the clusters. Some clusters were randomized to treatment, some clusters or barbershops were randomized to control where the barbers just simply promoted follow-up with the primary care physicians and encouraged lifestyle modifications. They had some materials and flyers um, to kind of educate them about hypertension um, and so forth. Uh, the primary outcome was change in systolic blood pressure at six months. Um, the uh, study team consisted not only of the uh, primary care physicians, the pharmacists, um, and um, uh, the barbers, but also um, they had an independent survey company, Westat, which um, was um, important to train the barbers uh, to make sure everybody um, really conducts the study according to the protocol. And then also they identified barbershops um, that were eligible and uh, most likely to be successful in this program. Inclusion criteria were uh, non-Hispanic black men, obviously, ages 35 to 79. Um, they had to be regular patrons. And the systolic blood pressure had to be 140 um, or greater at least on two occasions, on two different separate screening days. Uh, the protocol, um, they measured uh, blood pressures with automated in-barbershop blood pressure devices. So they just parked the device in the barbershop. Um, they uh, uh, collected five consecutive blood pressures, um, average the lifestyle last three, uh, which kind of gets rid of a lot of the uh, white coat um, issue in patients. Um, and then in-person structured laptop interviews that collected personal demographic and medical data. Um, these, this is the flow diagram. So 390 patrons um, in 52 bark shops were randomized. Um, 139 patrons in the intervention group, 180 in the control group. Um, very few were lost to follow up, um, and finally, 132 um, were used for uh, to collect the complete six months data in the intervention group, and 171 um, in the control group. Uh, the important point here is 95% cohort retention, which among in this study group is really almost unheard of. <laughs> it's because patrons were regular patrons who've been going to their barbershops for uh, something like 10 years. Um, so that was a real important point of why this program was so successful. So again, uh, we enrolled um, 28 barbershops in the intervention group, <coughs> in the control group. Um, the years of business, um, so they were in business for over 17 years. If you look around the LA area, especially in Beverly Hills, you see shops closing and opening every two, three months or so. So this year's in business is really meaningful. Um, they've been in there forever, and that's why they have such a, a good clientele. Um, participants, I already uh, told you how many were um, in each group. Uh, frequency, so they got a haircut about every two weeks in both groups, so that was uh, very similar. Um, and they actually went to the same barbershop um, on average 10 or more years. Um, the mean age of this group was um, 54. 
Um, and that was very equal between the two groups. Um, the half of them were married, um, were, uh, had some degree of education, uh, certainly not very high. Um, the household income, less than 25,000, was actually 30% 25, was actually um, in the control group and 41 in the intervention group, which is remarkable. Um, and re regular medical providers, um, about 80% um, had a primary care physician that they saw on a regular basis. Um, here's some other characteristics. Um, and here's the model pretty much. Um, so the barber is central to the whole model. Um, the barber interacts with the pharmacist. Um, the patron and the barber interact with each other. Um, there was an incentive of getting free haircuts with their blood pressure check. Um, but I don't think it was ne necessary to keep them in the barbershop because they already went there for 10 years. Um, and then there was feedback between the pharmacist and the physician, the primary care physician, but also Ron Victor, who was the hypertension specialist, of course, in the study, um, to make sure that um, everybody stays on track and we focus on reduction of blood pressure. Yes? For your location of your barbershops, did you control for like, zip code or particular geographic area? So our, well, our barbershops span 450 square miles of Los Angeles County, so they were all over the place. But when he does present the results, both at six and 12 months, the way that we clustered barbershops was based on the day that they were enrolled and also their geographic location. Less than 12 So it was, yeah, taken into consideration. Okay, the goal of this, this program was to, to get blood pressure to less than 130 over 80, which were, is the 2017 ACCHA guidelines. Um, and this goal was set actually before these guidelines came out, but they were, it was always the goal um, in our hypertension center to get people, patients to this goal. Um, and I was specifically asked to talk a little bit more about the medications we used in this program, some of which are not necessarily the same that ALL uses, um, but are very highly effective, and Ron Victor was very um, adamant about these medications because there's some good evidence um, why these are very highly effective medications. So first step is a calcium channel blocker plus an ARB or an ACE inhibitor. Um, most of the times, if the insurance allowed it, it would be would have been amlodipine and talmisartan, oftentimes irbisartan, going down the list of costs, um, other angiotensin receptor blockers were usually used. Um, second step, um, if this wasn't enough to add a thiazide type diuretic, um, Ron Victor really liked endapamide, which is um, probably um, very close to clothalidone in the pharmacodynamic um, um, efficacy and blood pressure lowering efficacy, um, and also uh, in terms of complications uh, with metabolic derangements. Um, and then the last step, or third step, was to add an aldosterone antagonist. Ideally, Plaranon, but if that wasn't covered, because that's not a very cheap medication, um, spironolactone. Uh, plasma electrolytes and creatinine were uh, checked with a point of care device with a finger prick. Um, and then uh, to give you a little background on why Ron used these medications. Um, so first of all, blood pressure goal at 130 over 80 was pretty much um, determined by uh, the SPRINT trial. And the SPRINT trial also informed the 2017 hypertension guidelines. Um, and what happened in the SPRINT trial is they allocated uh, uh, enrolled patients of um, intermediate to high risk, actually, um, to uh, two treatment goals, um, one less than 120, the other one less than 140. Um, and the actual average blood pressure reduction um, actually was very close to the set goal. Um, they enrolled 9,361 non-diabetics with a mean 10-year cardiovascular risk of 20%. So they're, on average, um, high risk. Um, and the treatment effect was um, statistically very significant and clinically meaningful. Um, there was a 25% reduction in cardiovascular events, for which, which was a, um, um, uh, uh, um, it was uh, myocardial infarction, stroke, heart failure hospitalization, and all-cause mortality. Um, and it also decreased all-cause mortality, which is so important because other trials uh, may have shown an improvement on cardiovascular um, events, but not an improvement of overall mortality. So this trial did both, and even more so on death, which is really important. Um, and kind of in opposition to that um, stands the HOPE 3 trial, which we heard a lot about already by Jim, um, which 
kind of made me a little bit worried because it kind of left the uh, lingering aftertaste that blood pressure medications don't do anything to reduce uh, mortality. Um, so the average reduction in the two treatment groups in this trial, we heard the patients who were allocated to canisart and hydrochlorothiazide versus placebo um, in a factorial design and then statin on top of it um, was 134 versus 128. So um, much less difference between the groups and top of it, their overall risk was much less, and only a third had hypertension. Um, and the medication they used was 12.5 milligram of hydrochlorothiazide and 16 milligram of candesartan. Um, and here's the result, uh, sobering. Uh, there was no statistical significant reduction um, for the blood pressure treatment arms, um, either in reducing MI or reducing stroke. Stroke, maybe there was a slight uh, uh, trend. Um, and why? Did it not work? So um, back in 1986, some smart men already published that um, the present results indicate that a 12.5 milligram dose of hydrochlorothiazide is significantly less effective than higher doses, makes sense, and is probably too low to provide adequate antihypertensive um, activity in most patients, even when combined with a second drug. Um, so going from that to a little bit more, uh, to a newer study that looked at ambulatory blood pressure um, reduction, um, you see that uh, thiazide uh, taking in the morning reduces blood pressure for about half of the day, and then the other half of the day, blood pressure kind of trends up, versus if you compare this to clothalidone, um, the blood pressure lowering effect is really throughout the day. Um, and importantly, um, the nighttime blood pressure is lowered much more with clothalidone than with hydrochlorothiazide, which um, appears to be um, probably the, the most important predictor of cardiovascular outcomes when it comes to blood pressure measurements. Um, so that's an important point. Um, and the difference at 4 a.m., as pointed out here, is 35 millimeter in this study. Um, and then some other, there's been some other meta-analysis that compared clothalidone with hydrochlorothiazide, and just to, um, give you a little intro to that, there really has not been a good head-to-head -head trial between the two drugs. But 29 trials of clothalidone, which um, included uh, about 3,000 uh, patients, those ranged 12.5 to 200 milligrams, I don't know who would use 200 milligrams of, uh, of clothalidone. Um, and 108 trials of hydrochlorothiazide um, involving 28 hundred um, patients with also a very wide dose range. Um, 12.5 and 25 milligrams of clothalidone produced a statistically greater reduction of systolic blood pressure compared to hydrochlorothiazide. It was minus 24 versus minus, 20, um, minus 14 millimeters mercury. Um, but there's also greater risk, more effect, most of the times also produces more side effects. There was also a greater reduction in potassium levels, um, something that you have to pay attention to. Um, and then in addition, nine randomized trials um, involving uh, over 78,000 patients examined the reduction of cardiovascular events um, defined as myocardial infarction, new coronary artery disease diagnosis, or CHF exacerbation um, in patients receiving clothalidone, six trials, or hydrochlorothiazide in three trials. Clothalidone was associated with a greater reduction in events um, compared to HCTC um, with about a risk reduction of 18%. Um, but, like I said, there were really no direct head-to-head comparisons of those two drugs. Um, in addition, there's some data that 24-hour uh, blood pressure data um, of hydrochlorothiazide to doses uh, between 12.5 and 25 milligrams uh, was actually only 6.5 over 4.5 millimeter and was inferior to all these listed um, medication classes. Angiotensin uh, converting enzyme, angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, converting enzyme inhibitors, um, the reduction was 12.9 over 7.7 .7 millimeters. Angiotensin receptor block is slightly higher, and that's why we use it, 13.3 over 7.8 millimeters. Um, even beta blockers who are not even on the uh, first three drugs of choice for hypertension treatment, um, they are more effective, and calcium channel block is also much more effective. So this is a little bit of a background. Um, in addition, the question always comes, um, ACE inhibitor or ERB are they equal? Um, they're probably equal in many cases. Um, the reason why we use ERBs 
because now there's solid evidence that um, ARBs are at least as effective at ACE inhibitor than like ACE inhibitors. Um, and they seem to be much safer, so the continuation rates of ARBs are much higher than in ACE inhibitors. You don't get the cough, you have less um, incidence of angioedema, which is a very rare complication, but a very serious complication. Um, and patients just seem to take it more frequently, so compliance rates are much higher with ERPs. And there's actually been um, a really good um, uh, sort of uh, summary of all trials by Franz Messerly, who argues um, that ACE inhibitors should really not be used anymore if we take cost out of the equation. So um, it's a good read. Um, and then the difference is, just to point out again, why was Sprint so successful and HOPE 3 was, so, was not successful at all? So clearly there was greater risk in Sprint, which led to a greater risk reduction, and that's true in every trial. The higher the risk, the greater the benefit. Um, the greater blood pressure difference between the groups clearly um, was a much easier to, de to detect benefit, but also easier to detect harm. So we also are more confident that um, this approach is actually safe. Um, and then in order for antihypertensives to be effective, blood pressure has to be elevated. And in HOPE 3, only a third of uh, people had hypertension, at least according to the 140 over 90 um, um, classifications. And medications in HOPE 3, they use canisartan and hypomorphizide, as I pointed out. The 12.5 is probably not effective. Um, and canisartan is a relatively weak ARB. Um, both have relatively short half-life, so wash out half of the day and probably don't provide the ideal um, um, coverage um, and reduction in blood pressure. Versus in sprints, they used um, really the Ferrari of um, hypertensive medications, which is azosartan and clothalidone, a um, and a combination of amlodipine, just the strongest ERB, probably the strongest calcium channel blocker, um, and thiazide, all three of which have a half-life um, north of 24 hours, so they really provide 24-hour blood pressure coverage, and that's why um, we use it in barbershop as well. Um, just uh, one slide on uh, problems with high-intensive uh, prescription. It's always concerned that you over-treat. Um, are you going to actually make patients worse? Are you going to make them fall? Are you going to make them um, have more renal failure? So um, there was no increase in sprints in injurious falls. Um, there was no increase in orthostatic hypertension, which is something we really have to uh, look out for with azosartan and clothalidone. Um, and there was no increase in acute coronary syndrome. That's this whole issue with J-curve, with lowering uh, diastolic blood pressure too much. Um, however, there was an increase in hyponatremia, in hypokalemia, and acute kidney injury. So, mm -hmm pointing out that you can't just prescribe these um, highly potent medications, you just have to follow the patients and make sure they get their basic metabolic panels checked um, a week and a month after you prescribe these medications. So this is pretty much our approach in the hypertension treatment uh, in the hypertension center and also in barbershop, first line ERB and amlodipine, uh, second line thiazide diuretic, ideally in dapamide or clothalidone. Um, these are the things you have to watch out for. Third line, an alto block, a spironolactone, or ideally a plerinon if you can get it, get it um, approved by the insurance. Um, and then fourth line would be a vasodilating uh, beta blocker like carvedilol or nevivolol, which have much better tolerance um, than metoprolol, atenolol, and the other beta blockers, um, and actually have a much better blood pressure lowering effect than, uh, uh, than these. And then nitrates finally are definitely on the bottom end of, of our list, um, but they do work. Uh, lower systolic blood pressure, especially in isolated systolic hypertension, uh, like Stan Franklin showed in, in the year 2000. Um, here's just a slide on the efficacy of spironolactone when it's added on uh, two other medications, um, ERBs and amlodipine in this trial. Um, so really a significant blood pressure reduction on top of very effective medications. All right, back to the bar barbershop. So this is kind of how um, our uh, data intake looked. And this is an example of a patron that started at 173 of 113 um, with the right medications, amlodipine and irbisartan, um, dropped very quickly to below 130, and eventually to 115 over 71. Um, so this is just one example of how easy it is with two prescribed medications 
um, to go get to gold. Um, and then this is the result of uh, the barber shops at six months. Uh, the intervention group had a baseline 153, um, control group 155 uh, of systolic blood pressure, and it dropped down by 27 uh, millimeters in the intervention group and 9 millimeters in the control group. Um, and then the intervention effect was 21.6 millimeters, obviously highly statistically significant. <coughs> um, and there's really not many trials that showed such an intervention effect. Um, this slide shows you that the blood pressure lowering was really across all clusters in the intervention group. So it wasn't uh, one barbershop that um, fared very well and the other ones didn't. Um, blood pressure reduction was really seen across all clusters and was not seen in, across all um, control clusters. Um, secondary outcomes, uh, the mean group difference in blood pressure reduction, uh, systolic again 21.6 diastolic uh, 14.9, which is also highly significant, um, and uh, how many patients actually did get to goal. Now, um, going by the stringent goal of 130 over 80, 64% um, made it um, in this group, in the intervention group, and in the control group, 11.7. Uh, the group difference, again, uh, is, is, is significant. Um, why uh, was blood pressure lower? Obviously, they were on more medications, on average about two medications uh, more per patron. Um, there was more amlodipine, more long-acting ARBs, more endapamide versus hydrochlorothiazide, more plerinone or spironolactone added on as a fourth-line agent. Um, then the pharmacists were doctoral level. Uh, there's uh, one example of uh, the two main pharmacists that worked in the study. Um, they were really specialty trained by Ron Victor, so I don't think any clinical pharmacist um, uh, automatically could do this, so they have to be specialty trained. Um, they were American Society of Hypertension certified, both of them, um, so they sat for the exam. Um, also, the program is convenient, so the medical treatment actually happens for the most part in the barber shop, so they don't have to go to doctor's offices. Makes it very convenient um, and easy to adhere to. Um, it was endorsed by Barbers, which was um, uh, a trusted community member. Um, the consistent patronage facilitated the blood pressure management um, and kind of made sure that everybody you were enrolled came back and hence the 95% uh, cohort retention. Um, and then uh, aiming for lower blood pressure goals is always important. Uh, for example, in the Kaiser cohort with an 80% control rate, um, I think the mean blood pressure is about 120, 122, or 124 or so. So it's, um, it has to be very low, the goal, if you want a large proportion controlled. Um, Okay, and then safety, the intervention was uh, very safe and well tolerated. There were no severe adverse events. Um, there were three cases of reversible acute kidney injury um, in the intervention group, all related to indapamide, um, which you just have to look out for. Um, next question was, okay, so this is at six months, but do these results drop off um, if the uh, intervention effect becomes less intense, if the pharmacist interacts with the patients um, less often? And uh, the 12 months results that were actually published in circulation just recently um, showed that the effect was completely sustainable. Um, the 12 months results um, were very similar to the six months results, um, both in systolic and diastolic blood pressure reduction. Um, and the control rate um, was also um, about the same, actually a little bit higher, 12 months compared to um, six months. Um, and this um, reiterates, again, just shows differences of the used medications in the intervention and the control arm was about the same. Again, um, more long-acting ARBs, uh, more calcium channel blockers, uh, more thiazide, long-acting thiazide type diuretics, um, and uh, more aldosterone blockers in the intervention group. Okay, and this, we know that graph too, and this showed, again, that um, across all clusters and barbershops, the results were sustainable up to 12 months. So the conclusion, uh, the drug therapy in barbershops by specialty trained pharmacists, as compared with standard therapy by primary care uh, practices, resulted in a much larger blood pressure reduction in the shop's hypertensive patrons. Um, these results were uh, sustainable with less pharmacist visits after six months to 12 months. Um, and as black men have many cardiovascular risk factors, market blood pressure reduction 
if sustained and initiated widely, may reduce high hypertension-related disability. 